Welcome everyone to tonight's virtual small talk. Uh, for those who may not know, virtual small talk is a casual and lively discussion with the Transcona Museum curators on topics related to the museum and the community of Transcona. And we are so very excited to bring these to you virtually. Thank you for joining us again. Um, you will be muted and your video will be turned off. To ask any questions or to communicate throughout the presentation, please use the chat function. You can find that in the meeting controls along the bottom of your screen. Feel free to ask questions throughout the talk and we will try and get to as many as we can. Uh, if you post anything inappropriate though, you will be removed from the meeting. You can leave the meeting at any time. However, we may lock the meeting after about 20 minutes or so um, and you may not be able to rejoin after that. There will also be a live Q&A at the end of the talk, so we can uh, get to any questions we probably weren't able to during the talk or answer new ones. So my name is Jennifer and I will be leading the talk tonight on the Sea and Transcona shots. And with me is Elana. Hello. Um, and we're gonna get started. Yeah, I'm doing the behind the scenes, so I'll be the one relaying your questions to Jennifer. Mm -hmm. So once again, tonight is all about the history of the CN Transcona shops. And before we get started, I would like to acknowledge that we are meeting on Treaty 1 territory, the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota and Dene peoples, as well as the homeland of the Métis Nation. To begin our talk tonight, I'm going to start with um, a brief history and overview of the Canadian National Railway and the Transcona shop. So in 1907, the Dominion government and the Grand Trunk Pacific Railway jointly purchased about 800 acres east of Winnipeg for the building of the Transcona shops. The initial plan called for a modest repair facility, which included an 18 stall roundhouse and related facilities. The facilities were expanded, uh, raising the total cost um, from 1.5 million to 4.5 million. When completed, the shops would have the capacity to build locomotives and other stock, as well as handle all heavy repair work. Uh, the major tender for construction was awarded in 1909 to Haney, Quinlan, and Robertson. The firm's partners included some of the more prominent engineers and contractors of the day. John Michael Haney, um, who lived from 1854 to 19. 27 was a well-known Irish engineer who worked uh, for several other railway contractors in Canada and the United States. Uh, Hugh Quinlan, who lived from 1858 to 1927, was a Montreal-based general contractor, and his son um, actually also worked on the Transcona shops as well, and he served in the First World War was unfortunately killed in action and his name is commemorated on the Transcona Cenotaph. And a local restaurant that just opened recently on the corner of Regent and ba uh, Day Street is named Quinlan's after this Quinlan family. Mm -hmm. Angus William Robertson, who lived from 1858 to, I'm not sure when, uh, was well known in the engineering and building construction um, throughout Canada. So building began on the Transcona shops in 1909, and during construction, the level of the ground was raised to approximately four feet by um, heavy gravel fill that they brought in to uh, the Transcona area. And this was to avoid flooding as the South Transcona area was uh, prone to periodic flooding in the springtime. A, four, uh, sorry, a 12 inch water main was built from the Red River to the shops in 1910. And in 1911, machinery was installed in the first unit of the shops. An estimated 400 men were working at the shops when it was officially opened on the 20th of January, 1913. And ownership of the shops would transfer to the National Transcontinental Railway and Canadian Government Railways and then eventually the Canadian National Railway after 1919. The shops themselves had the capability of handling practically all the repair work done on the transcontinental line from Quebec to Winnipeg, 
and heavy repair jobs uh, for the Grand Trunk Pacific from Winnipeg westward. Uh, the shops com is composed of three main departments and several other shops facilities. There's the car department located to the north, the motive power shop to the south, and the powerhouse is centrally located to reduce power and heat transmission losses. The Canadian National Railway itself was incorporated on the 6th of June 1919, forming Canada's only transcontinental railway company. It was an amalgamation of five financially troubled railways during the years of 1917 to 1923. And these railways included the Grand Trunk and its subsidiary, the Grand Trunk Pacific, the Intercolonial, the Canadian Northern, and the National Transcontinental. It is referred to as the Canadian National Railways between 1918 and 1960 and the Canadian National from 1960 to the present or the end. So now I'm going to talk about the shop's proposals and we have two diagrams from 1910 and 1912. Uh, Please excuse the quality of this one. It was rather large and we don't have a smaller scanned copy of it. Um, but this was the shop's proposal from 1910. And it shows the layout of the shop's facility um, with, if you can see my mouse here, and the mouse does not want to work. Um, but on the far left side, there is a um, index of all the shop's buildings, which we will be covering in this presentation. And then this is the plan uh, from 1912, uh, very similar, just a few modifications to the layout of a few buildings, but uh, generally um, the plan is the same. And this is an image here, an overview of the shops complex from about the, I want to say 1950s. You can see the roundhouse um, at the top of the image here. This is uh, towards the south of the complex uh, with the midway running through the center. And another overview image of the shops. Uh, once again, uh, the roundhouse here, which is to the south side of the complex, the midway here, and then this is Pandora um, running um, alongside the shops. And South Transcona is up at the very top of the image. Correct. Uh, this image is about 1970s, 1980s, I believe. The roundhouse was torn down in the 70s, I believe. I know we get to it in the presentation. Um, okay. So probably not the 80s because of the roundhouse being there. I unfortunately don't have my, uh, that information with me, so I don't have an accurate date. Uh, so now we're going to get into a discussion of the original buildings that comprise the uh, CN Transcona Shops complex. And I'm going to be basing this off of that 1910 uh, building plan. So the first building is the locomotive shop built in 1912. It was expanded in the 1970s and again in 1991. The main locomotive repair facility um, is where major locomotive and component repairs are provided. It's connected to the boiler and tank shops. It was remodeled in 2011 and now includes a training facility and upgraded lunchrooms. An addition built in 1991 includes a locomotive wash and preparation and paint facilities. So if my mouse wants to work, it is this building right here, number one, at the locomotive shop. And this is the midway here um, for, uh, for orientation. And an image, an early image, um, just after the shops was built um, of the interior of the locomotive shop. So it's quite a very large facility as that is a locomotive sitting within that building. Uh, number two, the storehouse. It was built in 1912, expanded in 1956 and 1978. It's used for sh 
CN shipping and receiving. The newest por portion is used for warehousing and office space. And the original section is now empty due to engineering concerns and is slated to be demolished at some point in the future. And it is building number two right down here at the bottom. I was actually visiting a museum in Mushtra, the Western Development Museum, and they have a caboose that you can go into. And in the caboose was uh, a wooden box. And on the wooden box, it said, return to Transcona stores. Oh, really? Uh, went empty. So I was like, oh, we're connected. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was a really interesting find to see, you know, elsewhere. And, you know, I, because of um, the museum, I, I knew what shops, like what Transcona shops they were referring to and, and stuff like that. So that was really cool. Mm -hmm. And another view of the storehouse, so that would be them here, if you can see my mouse, uh, the building closest to the roundhouse. And this is a very early image, so about the 1910s, 1920s, and that is South Transcona in the upper portion of the photograph here. And before I get too, too far along, um, I'd just like to say that information that is provided in this presentation mostly came from our anniversary books, the Transcona anniversary books. Um, it is somewhat hard to come by information about the Transcona shops. Um, as well, I don't have a whole lot of images in this presentation just because many of our images don't have descriptions associated with them. So it was sometimes hard to tell which building it actually was at the complex. So what images do make it into this presentation are ones that have been fully described and captioned. So moving on to the Ford shop, it was built in 1909. It was later divided into, into the forge and machine shop, reorganized in 1993. Uh, mechanical supply and quality control department offices are housed here. The remaining east end of the shop is used for additional wheel shop material storage, and the maintenance garage was moved to this complex in 2011. Building number three, the Ford shop, right here alongside the locomotive shop. The oil house uh, was built sometime between 1909 and 1913 unknown if it moved location or was demolished. And it is that itty bitty building right here, number four, at the very uh, southern end of the shop's complex. Number five, the powerhouse, built in 1913. It's the distribution center for many of the shop's utilities, and upgrades have been made over the years Major switch gear for electrical distribution to various buildings is located in this building, and its associated smokestack was demolished in 2014. That's building number five right here with its uh, smokestack. Number six, locomotive carpenter shop built sometime between 1909 and 1913, and it provided all the heavy woodwork required, for example, to produce and repair all wooden interiors for locomotives and cars. And this shop has since been demolished. And that is building number six, right here. The gray iron foundry, built in 1912. It houses the electrical shop and traction motor shop. The main repair shop for traction motors as well as main and auxiliary generators. And traction motors for the GM ma uh, managed locomotive fleet are also reconditioned in this facility. And that is building number seven right here.
And this is a photograph of the interior of the building um, sometime during its construction in the early 1910s. Uh, a photograph of some of the workers who worked at the foundry. And some heavy equipment located within the shop as well. Number eight, crude oil storage, built sometime between 1909 and 1913, most likely demolished during the extension of the locomotive shop in the 1970s. And crude oil storage is right here, number eight, the small little building here. Frog and truck shop, number nine, built sometime between 1909 and 1913, provided track components that allowed locomotives uh, to cross from one adjacent track to the other, most likely demolished during the expansion of the locomotive shop in the 1970s. And that is this building right here, number nine, located right next to the locomotive shop. Number 10, the stores platform, built sometime between 1909 and 1913, has since been demolished. And that is building number 10, right here, located along the midway at the southern end of the shops complex. Number 11, the forge, forge stores and scrap bins, built sometime between 1909 and 1913, most likely demolished during the expansion of the wheel and machine shop. That's building number 11, located right here. Number 12, lumber sheds, built sometime between 1909 and 1913, used for seasoning or storage of lumber, has since been demolished. And that is building number 12 here, uh, located on the northern um, section of the shops complex. Scrap platform and storage bins, number 13, built sometime between 1909 and 1913, most likely demolished during the expansion of the freight car shop. And that's number 13, this little section of building right here. And this new public road right here, that is Pandora. The dry kiln, built sometime between 1909 and 1913. Location moved to beside the lumber sheds. It was used for wood drying, also seasoning lumber to reduce moisture content within the wood, has since been demolished. That's building 14 right here. Um, as I mentioned, it had moved locations, so it was actually moved um, right here in the 1912 plants. Wheel and machine shop, built in 1913, expanded in 1954, 1971, and 1983, used entirely for the freight and locomotive bearing and wheel set repair and production line. That's building 15 located right here. So a wonderful interior shot of the, of the building um, right around uh, the time of its construction in the early 1910s. And another image here of the machinery located within this building, as well as some um, workers in the shops as well. The freight car shop, built in 1913 and has been expanded, a combination of former freight and coach repair shops. It performs aluminum and steel freight car repairs and or modifications. Also a certified car builder and has built steel, coal, 
box, bulkhead, gondola, and hopper cars, and it houses the air brake facility, air brake shop facility. That's building 16, this one right here, located on the northern end of the shops, uh, adjacent to the midway. Number 17, the wheel foundry, built sometime between 1909 and 1913, used to cast the steel wheels for railroad cars, has since been demolished. And that's this building right here, number 17. And an image of the exterior of the building, uh, date unknown. The planing mill, number 18, built in 1913, also referred to as the wood mill. In later years, it was used as an employee gymnasium as well as a storage space, demolished though in 2002. And 18, number 18, so that's this building right here. A fantastic image of the wood mill interior uh, right around uh, its construction, so early 1910s. The paint storehouse, number 19, built sometime between 1909 and 1913, most likely demolished during the expansion of the freight car shop. Now this little guy right here, building 19. The coach paint shop, number 20, built in 1913, was last used for repairs to air brakes and demolished in 2002. And that's this building right here, number 20, um, <clears throat> located along Pandora Avenue. And in, during the First World War, this uh, the building was actually turned into a, <clears throat> pardon me, a shop for producing uh, heavy artillery during the First World War. So teams of uh, workers would work round the clock producing these 18 pound shells, which would later be sent off um, <clears throat> to the Western Front in Europe. And we have a couple of those um, shells uh, they're they're not live, but we have a couple of those shells in our collection as well. Mm -hmm. So the coach shop number twenty one, built sometime between nineteen oh nine and nineteen thirteen. More information is needed on its history, but it was demolished at some point. And that's <clears throat> this building right here at the very top along Pandora. Um, building 21. So number 22, the car department office, built sometime between 1909 and 1913, most likely demolished during the expansion of the freight car shop. Well, and there's my mouse. And this is building 22 right here, located along the midway. We do have a few photos of this building. Um, so here it is right here. And an early photograph of um, employees who worked at the office. Uh, one of my favorite aspects of this image is that um, there are at least two women uh, pictured in the photograph. So early evidence of female workers at the Transcona shops. Of which we are missing in for, like uh, in our collection, we don't have that much representation of women who worked at the Transcona shops. So we're always looking for more information or even artifacts associated with women who worked at the Transcona shops. Absolutely. Moving on to number 23, the Motive Power Department, built in 1913. Uh, this two-story office building uh, was complete with a full basement 
It last occupied, um, was last occupied by the Prairie Division Engineering Services personnel, demolished though in 2007. And that's this building right here, number 23, located at the southern end near the roundhouse. And a few photographs um, of the motor power office. So uh, taken in the early years of the Transcona shop's history, as it does say Grand Trunk Pacific Railway up here. Another photograph, so this would have been around 1915, 1916, as it now says Canadian Government Railways. And another one of my favorite images, this is an image of uh, female stenographers who worked at the shops um, in this uh, office complex um, around the 1950s. One more image of the building, now it says Canadian National or CN. Number 24, the two million gallon reservoir. It was never built. It was replaced by the 100,000 gallon water tank and this water tank was demolished. If my mouse wants to work, it's that water tank right there in the center of the image. Oh, there it is. And number 25, the 24 stall engine house was built sometime between 1909 and 1913, also known as a railway roundhouse. And it was used for servicing and storing locomotives, complete with a turntable. And yes, Alana, you were right, it was demolished in the 1970s. Which just helps us date some of those photos that we do have in the collection that show it. Absolutely. And in, I think, the 1912 uh, plan, it was actually slated to be a 31-car uh, roundhouse, but they um, scaled it back a little bit. So there's that roundhouse right there at the bottom of the image. And an early image of the roundhouse from the Grand Trunk Pacific era, so uh, early 1910s. And another view uh, just along the outside of the roundhouse right here to the left of the image. Now I'm going to talk about a few early building additions uh, that weren't a part of the um, original proposals. So there was a fire hall. It was built in 1913. Uh, originally the fire hall and hose drying tower were located along the midway and it was later used as the nursing and occupational therapist building, uh, sadly though demolished in 2001. And I believe we actually have a fire hydrant from the shops that was connected to like the, the fire hall at the shops in our collection at the museum. Oh really, that's, that's the one? Yes. <laughs> the very heavy one that we... <laughs> that we moved into the basement after it had been on display. And we don't have an elevator, so Jennifer and I had to manually lift up this very heavy fire hydrant and move it downstairs. We did. It, though. We did. Um, so a very fantastic image of the fire hall complete with a uh, volunteer, I believe, volunteer fire crew. There was a sewage lift station built in 1913. Uh, the building was the collection point for all cemetery sewers on the property, and it has since been renovated in the 1990s. And a repair garage. It was built as a repair facility for the 100 plus pieces of mobile equipment used throughout the complex. And this work was moved to the machine shop consolidating the maintenance department in 2011. And now to some later building additions to the shops complex. The draft gear repair facility built in 1983. And this facility was created for repairing and testing locomotive and freight 
car draft gear. The Grit Blast and Freight Paint Facility, built in 1958 and expanded in 1986. This plant was recognized as a leader of its kind in North America, featuring automated hopper car grit blasting and robotic painting facilities. The grit blast system was upgraded in 2007. New automatic boilers and compressors were installed in 2010, and it operates completely independent from the powerhouse. The low test facility built in 1972 and expanded in 1991. It was designed to troubleshoot incoming locomotives and to perform complete testing after major repairs were completed, though demolished in 2002. And finally, the equipment storage garage, built in 1992, mainly used for the storage of yard maintenance equipment. So thank you very much for joining us tonight. Um, once again, we're so very pleased that we can bring these events to you virtually. Um, but these events are free, um, so if you are interested in supporting the museum, there are um, many ways in which you can. Uh, you can donate to the museum through Canada Helps, um, and that is located on our website. You can also donate to the Transcona Museum Fund, uh, which is supported by the Winnipeg, Winnipeg Foundation. Also, once again, can be done through our website. You can also become a museum member, um, so you can sign up and become a museum member and that is located under our events page on our website. You can also support us by staying in touch. So you can visit our website at www.transconamuseum.nb.ca. You can follow us on social media, including Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. Um, you can also check out our blog series available on our website. And you can also join our mailing list. Um, we send out a monthly e-newsletter at the start of the month, uh, which just includes updates, and exciting new events and programs that we may be offering at the museum. Um, so thank you very much for joining us tonight. Um, this is the last uh, virtual small talk that we will be doing for May. We're just going to be doing uh, taking a little bit of a break um, and then we will decide when we're going to pick up our virtual small talks again and we will be offering, um, obviously, new and different talks, so we're very excited about that. Yes, and right now we are working very hard to get the museum to the point where we're able to reopen. So uh, once we do, there may even be a combination of some, uh, we might be able to do the talks in person and hold them virtually at the same time. We are limited by the number of people who will be able to be in the museum, but that's something that we're looking at. We um, will just be taking uh, a week or two just to really get the museum ready so we can reopen and then we'll start up our talks again. Absolutely. And we'll be posting all this information on our social media and our website. Um, so never miss a beat. And we'll be sending out notifications to our mailing list subscribers and membership as well. Absolutely. Um, so once again, thank you so very much for joining us, and we hope to see you again. Bye. Bye.